Hey guys, my name is Emily. I'm a junior animal science major here at Delaware Valley University, and I'm gonna be showing you around my favorite school in the world. Let's go. Our campus is home to a little under 2,000 students total, so there would be about 500 kids in your graduating class. Business is currently our largest major on campus. It started as a national farm school, so it's really flourished since then. Here we have biology and human anatomy labs. We also have a physics lab way down there. And we also have a campus gleaner, so it's always good to stay on top of our yearly New York Times or articles. And here we have our physics lab and our computer science lab. So feel free to come study, do lab hours. One of the great things about having an open computer lab is you don't have to bring a printer to campus. You can print here for free. You just bring your own paper and you're all set. Also, any classroom that is open and has a whiteboard is a great place to come study with friends or if they have a projector, it's always nice to come watch TV. And downstairs, we have another computer science lab, our beautiful auditorium where I'm personally in our band. So that is where we perform and have concerts. And we also have smaller classrooms and larger classrooms where you can have anything from math to physics to science and everything in between. So if you were to live on campus, our freshmen are usually placed in Berkowitz, which is on the south side of campus, and then they are scattered around, whether that's Work Hall, Yulman, Cook, Barnes, and we have two suite style livings, and that is Centennial and South. I personally lived in Work Hall my freshman year. I loved it. It had a communal bathroom, girls floor and guys floor. And this is our lovely quad. We have A Day every year, and that is the last weekend in April, and it's a lot of fun. It's kind of like our little county fair on campus. We show our livestock animals. We have wiener dog races. Doylestown has local vendors that come and share their food, and every club and organization gets to fundraise and show off their club. A couple days ago, even, there was a dodgeball tournament, so the students always love to come here hammock, eat lunch, or just lounge around, do homework together. So to our right is work hall. Like I said, I lived here my freshman year and it is arranged girls floor and guys floor. There is a laundry room in work hall, which is fortunate. Um, some residence halls do not have laundry rooms and connected to work hall, there is Centennial, which also has a laundry room. The way that works is you download the free Speed Clean app and you have a $200 balance on your account already, so you don't have to bring quarters. I know my mom and I saved up quarters before I came to college and now I just have a bunch of quarters, so. Hi, I'm Nadia. I'm a senior here at Del Val. I'm the RA up on Yeoman Second. Come on in. Yulman has three floors to it. The first floor is all guys on the ground, and then the second floor is all females, and the third floor is also all females. This is my floor, the second floor. I have all mainly first year students, and they're all females. Here's my room.
So this is one of our traditional buildings. We have a communal bathroom with showers, toilets, and also sinks. Uh, for my room, it's set up as just a single since I am an RA, but normally there will be two beds, two desks, and I still have the two closets in here. The buildings really let you do a lot with it, so anybody can just decorate it and make it so it's fit to their own type of personality. As you can see, I like a lot of animals. <laughs> And uh, speaking of animals, I do have an ESA on campus. Her name is Lily. She's a 20-year-old cat, and she just likes to sleep quite a bit. But one great thing is that DelVal does allow us to have ESAs and service animals on campus, so it's a really big help for students who might need that type of support. And connected to work, I know I already mentioned it, but Centennial, in the basement, they have a game room, they have a laundry room, and they have a movie theater. So that's also a really great place to hang out with friends, lounge in the middle of the week. Straight ahead is Cook Hall. Next to it is Barnes. They are co-ed buildings. Cook actually includes a kitchen. So if you love to bake or cook with friends, that is a perfect place to do it. South on the other side of campus also has a kitchen. Right over here, we have one of the lounges on campus. All of the residence halls have lounges. Uh, this one's just one of my favorites. Uh, you have a lot of nice like seating, tables, so that you can do your homework, a lot of windows for natural light, a com couple comfy couches, and of course an AC and TV. So when it gets really hot, you can always just come to one of the lounges and relax. I like to do a lot of movie nights in here, so you can always just put a DVD player in that you can get a DVD from the library or you could always just hook your laptop up to it so everybody can have a nice relaxing night every once in a while. So we have the communal sinks in here, the communal bathrooms and then right over here we have some showers so that well obviously you can take a shower <laughs> And we have uh, some cubbies for any of your toiletries. A lot of people like to leave it in the bathroom because uh, everybody just understands, have respect for one another. My stuff is my stuff, your stuff is your stuff. And everybody feels comfortable and safe about leaving their stuff right here. You may also notice if you come on campus, you will see tags on the trees, the flowers, the grasses, just to label the genus and species of our beautiful arboretum, our 40 acres cover. So this is one of our many parking lots on campus. Freshmen are not typically allowed to bring a car on campus, um, but they can if they live off campus or they have a job off campus. They have a medical reason that they need to go to doctor's appointments regularly for. Um, however, once you are a sophomore and up, you can feel free to bring your car on campus. It is $80 a year, 40 a semester, which is pretty inexpensive compared to a lot of high schools I've heard from. So good to think about. We also have a blue light system on campus, so we are a very safe area, Doylestown, New Hope, Plumsteadville, um, and our campus, I make the joke that central Pennsylvania, eastern Pennsylvania is very dark at night and there are hardly any street lights and we stole all of them because it is very well lit here. Um, so you don't have to worry about safety and public safety patrols campus once at the top of every hour but it is for your general safety, just in case something were to happen. So we're coming up towards the student center. This is where a lot of studying happens, eating. We have a dining hall, but we also have another eatery called the pub. Um, we have a Mumjus auditorium, a mail center, and a bookstore, which is all the facilities you would find here. On the second floor of the student center, we have a commuter's lounge. We have a band room, a choir room, and more smaller classrooms. So this is our Mumjus Auditorium. Um, as you can see, pretty empty, but usually on the weekends we have bingo nights or we have trivia nights. Um, comedians, public speakers, they come and perform. Um, and convocation happens here as well. Something really popular that occurs is our homecoming dance and our CNO Expo. So that is our clubs and organizations expo. 
And by then, in the beginning of the semester, you will have a great group of friends. You'll see them all at different tables of clubs that they are a part of. And you'll join 20-something clubs. And then you'll be like, wait, that's way too much. And then you'll go down to four, um, which is what I did. Um, so that includes our fraternities, our sororities, which we have three of each. Uh, we have club sports, which include uh, soccer and lacrosse. Uh, we have a spike ball team, we have an American Sign Language Club. So those are just a few of the 70 plus clubs we have on campus. Okay. So this is our pub. This is another great place to come and eat on campus besides our dining hall. Um, I compare it to like a Wawa or a Sheets, um, depending on where you're from. I'm from Wawa territory, so I hope <laughs> you guys out there are Wawa people as well. Um, so it's made to order food, so if there's a day where you're not feeling what's ever in the dining hall, you want a chicken sandwich with mozzarella sticks and onion rings, all those good fried foods, you can come here, order it, and be on your way. So the hours are open from 11 to 6. Um, so. You can use your flex dollars here. That is another currency we have on campus. So the way that works is you have a $50, $150, or $250 balance. Um, and it's kind of like a credit, kind of like a gift card to the pub. And sometimes you'll see at the end of the semester, not everyone used their flex dollars. So they're here the last week of school, they're buying all these snacks, having a feast for their friends. So kind of a use it or lose it policy. So this is our mail center. This is like our little post office on campus. This is a great place to work as a student as well. You can earn some extra cash. Um, so the way this works is on your school email, if your mom or dad or aunt, uncle send you something in the mail, they would say 700 East Butler Ave. That's the address for here. And then on your school email, you say you have a package or some kind of mail. You come pick it up before 4.30 and then you're all set. You can send things out as well. Um, and we also have Amazon locker boxes, which is even more convenient um, because if you get something from Amazon, you can come at 8 p.m., 2 in the morning, whenever you want. Another great way to see what we have going on on campus are our bulletin boards. So this is a student government board. They talk about what they do in their club, who the executive members are, positions they hold. And also this is a more social event club or bulletin board. Um, so they have what's going on in the months of August and September, whether that's a craft night, whether they're going to the Philadelphia Zoo. They do New York trips, which are free. You just put down a $5 deposit and then you just go crazy in New York. And then everyone meets up back at the bus. Um, and we also have E360 opportunities. So if you're looking at a horse ranch to work for, dairy farm, um, if you want to join poetry club. So those are all opportunities for you. And then this is our bookstore, another great place to work as a student. Um, we have toiletries, so if you don't have a car and you're out of shampoo, you can come in here, grab some. We have apparel, another great Christmas gift for your family, hint, hint. Um, so you can get Delval stuff, swag. Um, you can get um, technology, so they have great chargers and um, USB ports, and also books. So what's great about a small school is we have all your books lined up for you. You don't have to run around like a chicken with its head cut off looking for your books in a big library. So you just say, I have Dr. Langston for chemistry, whatever section she is, and then their books are all lined up for you. Our bookstore also has a really good buyback policy and they try to match their prices with Amazon and Chegg for your textbooks so you're not paying a great deal. Um, and at the end of the semester, if you get your books from the bookstore, they will buy them back. So another great way to earn back your money. So. And another cool thing I like to mention on campus is Caesar the Ram, he is our mascot. Um, and actually they're having a time capsule opening this A Day coming up. Um, I think it's the 25th year. So that'll be here. 
but if you were to come on campus and stand in the middle of this circle and talk to Caesar, it echoes back to you. So I don't know if you picked that up. That's really cool if you did. And over there past the trees is the Welcome Center. So that is where our public safety is stationed. Um, so if you lose your ID, key card, they're great and they will supply you a new one. They're also here 24 hours. So if you get locked out of your room, like my roommate did one time after her shower, she called public safety, they let her in and they don't talk about it because that's embarrassing for everyone. So, but I talk about it on tours because it's funny. But, um, and also very important, if you order DoorDash or Uber Eats, that's where you go pick it up. Um, and also we have outdoor basketball courts. We have a football stadium. Our teams are Division Three MAC champions for I think the past three years. So we have a great football team. Um, and also our soccer teams, lacrosse teams, field hockey teams, they are also extremely entertaining to watch and they win their games. Past the football fields, we have a SEPTA train station on campus, which is really convenient. Um, and we are part of R5, the Lansdale Doylestown line. So that can take you into 30th Street Station, Philadelphia, um, or you could go one stop to the left and that's Doylestown. Um, we also have a free shuttle for students known as the Doylestown Dart. And they are free for students. That takes you into town, giant Rite Aid, if you have to run some errands and you don't have a car. To our right, we have Samuel Hall. This is another residential hall on campus and it is sister buildings with Goldman right next to it, which essentially means that they are just identical. Um, Goldman Hall on the second floor, however, has an ag interest floor. So if you are a crop science major, horticulture, dairy science, you will mostly, most likely be placed up there with other science majors. And then in between those two buildings, we have Berkowitz Hall, and that is our only freshman dorm on campus. And the way that's laid out is all girls on the bottom floor and co-ed on the second. And then to my right, your guys' left, we have the gymnasium, which includes a weight room, it includes a wrestling room, our main gym where basketball, volleyball, and job fairs are held. My name is Chris Elliott. I'm the Assistant Athletic Director and Director of Sports Information at Delaware Valley University. And this is a quick tour of our athletics facilities. Start here with our recruiting room. A brand new room recently created, actually still in development. This is a place where coaches can come with recruits, with families, uh, describe a little bit about their program and the history of Del Val and and why students choose to come to Delaware Valley University for athletics and education. Through here is our visiting team locker rooms. So when away teams come, they get put in here, basketball, volleyball, uh, visiting baseball teams and such, we use these locker rooms. During a busy crossover season, when winter sports and spring sports are playing at the same time, a lot of times our baseball team will use this locker room in the preseason until base, basketball is done, and then they'll move into the main men's locker room. This is what we call our green gym or our upper gym. It's an auxiliary gym uh, used a lot for team practices. Baseball and softball will be in here at the start of their season, which is typically February. Uh, there's a batting cage that is temporary in here that they'll use for hitting practice. And attached to our green gym, are some coaches' offices. Through there would be coaches' offices. And back here will be one of our coaches' offices. And then that door over here will be a, a locker room available for coaches and officials to get changed and shower and, and store their stuff while they're here visiting. A lot of students uh, during non-COVID times will sit in here, uh, study with their teammates, do coaches meetings. It's a good place for, for student athletes to gather with one another. Restrooms, gathering area, our Hall of Fame walls are here. The Del Val Athletics Hall of Fame, the Conference Hall of Fame. 
And across the top, we have our team photos. Through this door here is our main gymnasium. This is the home of our men's and women's basketball teams, women's volleyball, and our men's wrestling team. And our women's wrestling team now, as of this year, will be competing inside James Work Gymnasium. The bleachers were recently renovated in about 2015, and the gym floor gets redone every couple years. The championship banners across the top are all new as of 2019. We have our sports assistant office here. Behind her sits the athletic director. And through this hallway is our athletic training facility. A lot of students spend time here getting treatment, getting better and recovering from the last game, getting ready for the next game. This is our men's locker room. A lot of teams are housed here. Uh, you can see currently we have men's soccer name tags on the lockers. As we transition into the winter, men's basketball and men's wrestling will share this room. And as we transition into the spring, it'll become a place for baseball to use a, a locker room. The showers were recently renovated about 2019. And as we exit through here, this is our wrestling room. Men's and women's wrestling coaches share this office. And in here is our wrestling room. Probably one of the shining pieces of our athletics facilities is this room here. Men's and women's wrestling now will practice in here. So now we're down at James Work Memorial Stadium, Robert A. Lipinski Field. Right now we're inside our away team locker room. So away football teams will come uh, to play us and, and this is where they'll be housed. And then in the springtime, this serves as the home locker room for our Aggie men's lacrosse team. This is where they'll prepare, change, coach gives his pump up speech, and then we're out to the turf for, uh, for our next contest. This is in the press box high atop the stadium, and on the other side of the field is the away team bleachers, uh, where visiting fans will come and enjoy the game themselves. So back underneath the bleachers is our head football coach's office our assistant football coach offices. There's about six or seven assistant football coaches that share the office. And attached to the assistant football coach's office is our home football locker room, uh, currently in use for a film session. It's called the Dick Clark Locker Room. Dick Clark, an alumni from 1950. So now we're down at Frank Wolfgang Field, the home of our DelVal baseball team. Uh, Frank Wolfgang, of course, longtime coach. He coached many sports here and most known as uh, uh, the athletic director. About 20 or 25 years spent as the athletic director uh, while he was coaching different teams. Uh, this dugout was dedicated to him in 2006, and friends of the program, donors, families all bought bricks to support the program. And we come around here is the Baseball field, uh, the dugouts on either side, behind home plate, you have some small bleachers, but a lot of times when parents and fans and families come, they'll set up lawn chairs in the grass area. And then you have the scoreboard out in left field. 
uh, about 420 feet to dead center. And then behind that is the SEPTA train tracks, which run through right field. So now we are at our outdoor practice field. It's a grass field. Uh, oftentimes in the fall and even in the spring, the, the turf will be overbooked with practices. So some of our teams will come out here to use it for practice. Right now it's lined for soccer. Men's and women's soccer will practice out here in the fall. Occasionally in the spring, you'll see our lacrosse teams practicing out here in the fall. I'm sorry, in the spring. And then behind me here is the DelVal softball field, very similar to the baseball field in the sense that fans and families and spectators will bring lawn chairs and set them up around the outfield fence or behind home plate. And on either side of the dugout, we have small bleachers available for fans. Behind home plate is our portable press box. So press and media will sit up there, broadcast the game, PA announcer, and, and stat the game from there. Coming up, we have Elson Hall, and this is our wellness center on campus. So if you have any kind of medical issue that can be resolved within the hours of nine to five, they are great to help. They are nurse practitioners inside. Um, they also have counselors. So if you need mental health days, they are awesome to talk to. Um, they do flu vaccines, they do COVID vaccines, COVID testing. So any kind of help you need, they're good for. Also, we do have the Doylestown Hospital three minutes down the road. So that is also convenient. If it's more of an emergency, public safety can drive you, um, the ambulance can drive you. So <laughs> we also have those. Um, and we have urgent cares all over. So my favorite part, we're coming up to the dining hall. So this is our main dining hall, only dining hall on campus since we are so small. And the hours are 6 a.m. to 10 at night. Um, they like to be open for the early risers, the kids that are working at the farms, our student-run farms. So they recognize we are busy people and we need to eat. So they're open early. So in the Levin Dining Hall, we have our Starbucks. So I hope you like coffee or tea. Because if you do, we do have a standard and a discounted plan. The standard plan comes with, di or comes with <laughs> unlimited Starbucks. So that includes frappuccinos on Wednesdays. It comes with desserts, pastries, um, the refreshers. I'm a huge fan of the refreshers. So who wouldn't want that? Unless you're not a coffee person, then I'm sorry. But maybe eventually you'll become a coffee person. There's hope for you. So. This is another great place to come and eat, hang out, study in between classes. Um, we have unlimited meal swipes here, which is very nice. You don't have to keep track if it's two meal swipes a day, 14 a week. So this is just come in, come out, and all you can eat. So if you have any allergens or um, food restrictions, you can easily email our staff and ask for gluten-free options, vegan, vegetarian options that are already offered anyways. But if you want more of a selection, they will definitely help you. So you would just swipe in, say hello. And our calendar actually tells you if there's like a fun holiday and that they're celebrating. So I'm excited for National Guacamole Day because who doesn't like guacamole, right? And so down this way, we have ice cream. We have our gluten-free, allergen-free station, which includes their own microwave, own toaster, and a nice clean area. So right now we have breakfast here, but we usually have pizza at the pizza station, and our dough is handmade. So I really like the pizza here. I think it's delicious. Um, and if you wanted buffalo chicken pizza that they didn't have, you know, you could always ask for it and they would be more than happy to make it. We also have a pasta station and then we have our grill. So that's hamburgers, hot dogs, grilled cheeses, french fries all the time. Then our seasons, so that's our home style section. So your, you know, your cravings, your, your fresh food. And then we have our Bravo station, so they have more gourmet options. They do acai bowls, they do sushi, National Guacamole Day, I'm sure they're gonna have crazy options. Um, then they have fruits, vegetables, our lettuce comes from our hydroponic labs on campus. 
We have fresh granola, yogurt. And then of course we have different drinks options, still tea and coffee, just in case. You do like regular coffee or tea, but you just don't want the Starbucks plan. This is our writing center on campus, and behind the dining hall we have a tutoring center, but the Miller Hall that is specifically designed for writing help. Um, our English professors, their offices are on the second floor as well as psych professors. And you can work here as a student, so that's another great job to have on campus, helping other students write. Or you could come in here for free help, um, or to print something with your own paper for free. And then we also have Siegel Hall. So I'll talk a little bit about E360. So our huge um, advocation for coming here is E360 and getting an internship or job before you graduate here. Um, so as an animal science student, I really grew to love dairy cows. I actually have never seen a cow before I came here. So it's funny how like you really change or you find new things that you really enjoy. So I love working with the dairy cows. I work at a dairy farm off campus. So that is my E360 and getting hands-on experience outside of the classroom. And here is our Kropskopf Library. Another one of my favorite places on campus. Hi, Peter. Good, how are you? So this is Peter. He is our librarian. <laughs> okay, so this is our library and we have two lounge areas. So this is the lobby. This is where I come here to study, hang out in between classes as well. Um, and we actually have two classes going on right now. Um, but they are like your larger size classrooms. Um, I've had animal husbandry, organic chemistry in these rooms. Um, they are also great to study if there isn't a classroom going on. And books. We have books in here. Uh, books downstairs and newspapers, magazines, DVDs, CDs, so any kind of research you need or leisure reading, we have it. And then we also have our memorial room, which is a beautiful historical uh, outlook on our whole campus. Um, so it started as the National Farm School in 1896, founded by Rabbi Joseph Kropskopf, um, and it helped future farmers of America learn experiential learning, learning on the farms as well as the labs, as well as the classroom. So they actually have freshman rules here from the 1937. They had the freshman tie. Very fascinating how times have changed. And another great place to kind of relax in between classes. And then we have a corner office, which is the replica of the rabbi's office. Um, his ashes, his wife and his eldest daughter's ashes are in there. But I always say he is, he's always with us, so <laughs> it's nice, <laughs> it's nice. And all of the books up top are donated and signed by the rabbi himself. So. You can check them out, but if you come here, you are able to ask a librarian or one of the students working at the circulation desk to grab one for you, and you can read it. And I like looking at the notes of the seeds and the fruits from the early 1900s. I think that's very interesting. And then, of course, we have all these important people that have founded the experiential learning idea. Um, the dairy farm I work at, they talk about Joshua Feldstein all the time. He was a president, I believe he was a student, an alumni, and a professor. Dr. Maria Gallo was our first female president, which I'm always proud to mention. Um, I think that's really important. And also how our ratio is like 60 girls to 40 guys now, which is a turn of events. <laughs> Actually, I noticed that there's an animal reproduction class going on, so if you're an animal science student, you will be having to take that and learn about artificial insemination and the reproduction cycle of every animal you are interested in. 
So this is Feldman. This is known as our agricultural building, only because our ag professors, their offices are mostly in this building. However, we, I've had physics in here. We have a computer lab as well, um, a chemistry lab, a media and communications lab for our media and communication majors. And you can see there's a class going on. But it is also a great building to come and study for. And then we have our chapel. So this is our oldest building on campus. And even though we have a chapel and we were founded by a rabbi, our university is non-denominational. Uh, we do have church services, however, Sundays 1030 in here, which I hear are very nice to go to. So a lot of alumni and faculty members have been married in the chapel. Uh, some initiation and processes of sororities and fraternities also occur in there. And I always say, depending on how your semester goes, if you need to pray before finals, that's a great place to go and do it. Um, we do recognize that some students are religious. Um, we do have a couple of Christian clubs for athletes. Um, I think it's our Newman's club as well. Um, so if you are religious, the campus is always accommodating towards that. Um, I know I'm personally Jewish, so when there was a Rosh Hashanah service, um, one of the members of the university actually drove me to a synagogue in the area. So even though we are not affiliated, you know, we still do accommodate. So we're actually heading up towards Mandel. This is home to one of our two small animal science labs, which we want unfortunately won't be able to go inside of um, but I will show you a couple labs going on um, it's also home to our only lecture hall on campus so this is Mandel 114 so this is our only lecture hall on campus and I don't know if you can peek through but you can see that the area is not fully filled um, the biggest class size that I've ever personally had was 40 students. I know that classroom I used for our chemistry final with three other sections, so a total of 60 students. And we still did not fill the whole room. So that is a good approximation of how big our school is. So like every academic building, there is a nice lounge for you to study once again in between classes or kind of relax um, or wait for your friends. That's what I do <laughs> when they're still in class and I got nothing going on. And down this hallway, we have food science labs, organic chemistry labs, and biochemistry labs. So in your schedule, you have, will have plenty of room for electives or to have a minor or dual major. So I always recommend that you take up some culinary classes just to learn how to cook or bake or be friends with a food science major, because that's very beneficial. They'll make you cake and beef jerky and all that fun stuff. And this is inside of an organic chemistry lab. There's nothing going on in there, but that is where you would most likely have organic chemistry lab. So if you didn't want to really commit to another major or a minor, or you didn't have room in your schedule for whatever reason for those electives, you can always take a club. So like I mentioned earlier, that's a great way to do food club. They go and eat food in Philly, which is like, who wouldn't want to do that? We have a club known as Floral Society, so they do a lot of floral arrangements that a lot of you know horticulture students or plant science majors run. And I always recommend, even if you are a large animal science major and you're kind of tossing around the idea of small animal science or conservation, to take some small animal science classes and see while I would like to work with lab rats or guinea pigs or cats that we have in almond, so you kind of have a good broad spectrum of different animals you've worked with. Lake Archer is this way. And that's a great scenic area to once again go and study, hang out with friends. 
And we do have a catch and release policy, so if you have a fishing license and you like to fish, go ahead. And Bio Club, they come in here and they kind of take samples of the water. They look at it under a microscope. So it's used for classes as well and just the community. You'll see a lot of community members and they're walking their dogs or biking or just walking by themselves, uh, enjoying the lake as well. So we're coming up towards more of our administrative side of campus. So here we have Lasker Hall, which I call our money building just because the bursar's office is in here, financial aid and registrar. So bursars, they're great to answer any of your questions about your um, e-statements or about your you know, tuition bill, financial aid. They're great for scholarships or if you need help with paying for college. Um, and they have a wall of scholarships and you can always go in there, see which ones you are compatible with and even apply to the ones that you're not and get free money because no one else applies for them. Um, and registrar, so your first semester of your freshman year, they will pick out your schedule for you. Um, and then once your first semester is over, you'll meet with your advisor and they will tell you where you should be at in your career. So if you should take this class versus this class, start up a minor, maybe dual major, or you'll graduate early, you know, they're the ones to tell you, they're kind of like your coach, so. And then we're coming up towards Almond Building. So that is where our Department of Criminal Justice and Business are, um, and our second small animal science lab with the cats in our basement. So if you are a criminal justice business major, you will be here a lot. You'll have classes in Life Science Building, even Feldman, as well as Allman, and these are where your professors will most likely be. And what's another great thing about college and taking classes at DelVal is your professors and advisors will be real life people in your field. And so my advisor is an actual vet, so she you know, tells me what vet schools are looking at, what they require now in admissions, so they kind of give you the inside scoop of what you need in real life. And then straight ahead, we have our admissions cottage, the admissions building, uh, so your admissions counselor, their office is in there. If you're a ambassador, you work here sometimes. Um, it actually used to be the president's old house, and the quad, used to be the football field, which thank God it's not anymore because I've ran on the quad and almost rolled my ankle. So now we have turf, yay. Um, so, but he was a very smart man, so he got to watch the football games from his house. This is the President's Residence, located on main campus. It is a historic house overlooking Lake Archer with a back patio suitable for entertaining and small events. The house has wood floors throughout with four bedrooms, three bathrooms, and additional multi-purpose rooms. My name is Emily, I hope you enjoyed the tour. And if you have any more questions, please go on our website, www.delval.edu. Bye. Hi, my name is Corey Kieschnick. I'm chair of equine science and management here at DelVal. Um, I've been here at the university since 2001 in a faculty role. And we're here at the um, DelVal Breeding Center. Come on in. All of our equine students are here at the breeding center. Um, during their first two years, they move back and forth between our two on-campus equine facilities. So they're here at the breeding center, they're also at the equestrian center, just to make sure that they're really gaining as much hands-on experience as they possibly can. Um, they're touching horses from day one. So here at the breeding center, we have about 24 stalls. Um, we do have a stallion barn, we have a breeding shed, and we have three spacious foaling stalls uh, with cameras as well. 
we have a herd of standard bred mares, um, standard bred brood mares, and we do breed horses for the standard bred racing industry. Um, we have a large client base. We also have a small warm blood breeding program as well. We stand different stallions here at the breeding center um, during breeding season. So that um, our stallions come in typically starting in January for the season. Um, and we'll stand a thoroughbred stallion, um, standard bred stallions, and a warm blood stallion all this breeding season. You'll see here that we have um, our breeding stocks where we are, our instructors who teach in the repro classes will do um, ultrasounds and different checks of the mares with the students. So they really are experiencing that hands-on learning here um, at the breeding season, at the breeding center. So we'll head back in here and go, look, we, I think we have a baby and a mom. This is our off season right now. So um, we don't have, our babies are, will start being born probably in February this year. Um, once those babies are born, when they're yearlings, then we take them to a sale in Harrisburg. So the students um, have an opportunity to participate in collection, insemination, and foaling out the mares, and then also in the sale of the horses. So it's a really from beginning to end product for them um, with the hands-on learning. What a good baby. So this is the breeding shed here. We have a hydraulic phantom uh, that goes up and down on a remote. And this is where our stallion management class students will participate in collections. Um, we also, because we stand a thoroughbred stallion, uh, we also do live covers. So they get the experience of both of those. And I'll show you in here is our lab where the students have an opportunity to do semen analysis, uh, but also some of our lecture classes will come down, they'll meet in the, bre in the breeding center lab. Um, you see it's set up here. For a class, we have a screen and a projector so that they um, can quickly meet for their lecture class and then utilize the horses here at the breeding center for hands-on purposes. So not only are they learning the theory in the classroom, but they're also practically using the horses um, at the on-campus facility. Welcome to the Equestrian Center. So we do have two equine facilities that are here on campus, just a short walk down from the residence halls, which is a big differentiator for us. Uh, we're one of the only equine programs who does have on-campus facilities. We have 52 stalls, an indoor and outdoor arena. We have an eight horse European style exerciser as well. We have a school horse herd, about two thirds of which are donated to us and one third of which are leased. They could be leased from community members or from um, alumni or from students or from various professionals um, in the area. So not only do our academic students ride here as part of the equine management major and also the equine science major, but also we have two equestrian teams under the Department of Athletics. Um, our hunt seat team and our dressage team both practice here and they also host competitions here when it's when it's our turn to host. We also have different clubs that utilize the facility and the horses so the equine club, the vaulting club, and the carriage driving club all use it as well. So really our equine facilities are highly utilized by a lot of different students, not just equine, but kind of all majors. Um, our equestrian center is a British Horse Society approved facility, 
and we are a testing center. So we test up through stage three. The BHS is comparable to the United States Pony Club. Um, so our students can graduate with an international instructor certificate level one. Here you'll see this is our eight horse European style exerciser. The horses head into this and can be eight at a time and they walk and trot. It helps with their fitness level and also helps to maintain soundness of the herd. Um, and here to the left is the hay barn and sawdust barn as well. As you can see, we have students here a lot, doing a lot of different things all the time because hands-on learning is such an integral part of what we do on a daily basis. Um, it's such an important part of our curriculum. So these students are here, they may be riding, they may be participating in a driving class, but they may also be um, working with their horse for equine behavior. They could be um, our equine and that in phys class meets here and they look at the they look at the skeleton on a PowerPoint and then they also look at the horse as a whole. So we use the horses for different purposes, for management and for um, riding and driving as well. And this is our indoor arena. We use this for our riding and driving skills classes, for our horse shows, and we also use the outdoor arena as well. Upstairs is where our uh, students who use the tack clean it um, and also we have lockers uh, particularly for the first year students but any student who wants to use one can um, and then this is the tack room we have a variety of saddles and different kinds of equipment our students are not required to bring their own tack we provide all of it for them You can see here at the end of the indoor arena, we have bleachers and those are for spectators uh, at our horse shows. We have people come in and sit in the bleachers and, and watch the competitions. And this is our outdoor arena um, where a lot of the riding skills classes meet as well. Um, and as you can see, there's plenty of areas to hack out uh, with the horses. Hi, I'm Dr. Bruce Richards. I'm co-chair of the Animal Science Department at Delaware Valley University, and I teach animal nutrition in a couple of dairy science courses, as well as Spanish for Agriculture. Welcome to the DelVal Dairy. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, we're going to start by showing you uh, the calves uh, back here. Uh, of course, this is one of our, our popular attractions at the dairy, uh, although we do have them behind a net to make sure that students aren't transmitting diseases between calves. Uh, one of the things that we like to do here at Del Val is student research, giving the students uh, an opportunity to develop their own research project and carry it through. Uh, and so you can see the scale sitting in front of the barns. Uh, the scale was actually gotten from a student research grant and I had a student uh, that did a research project where she compared feeding milk replacer to the calves uh, to pasteurized waste milk. And so she did that for one semester and compared growth weight in the calves. Turned out she loved it so much, she ended up doing her master's degree at the University of New Hampshire, uh, also doing calf growth research, and now she's pursuing her PhD there. So that's one of our uh, exciting things that we're able to do here at the dairy is to do student research with the students. So here at Del Val, we milk about 50 dairy cows, and we have about the same number of young stock uh, that are from birth to two years old when they, they have their first calf. Uh, we are proud to have all of the major dairy breeds in the United States represented here at Del Val. Uh, so we have the opportunity to teach students about the different uh, strengths of each breed of, of dairy cow. So these are older heifers uh, that are getting approaching uh, breeding and calving age. Uh, so you can see the black and white heifer there, she's a Holstein. We have uh, red and white Holsteins. We also have air shears uh, that you can see there, the red and white heifers.
and we have a brown Swiss and a milking shorthorn as well. So uh, we, we represent the different major dairy breeds. We also have jerseys. Don't see any immediate right now, but we have them represented as well. Uh, Mr. Mayer is the uh, dairy superintendent and he works uh, to allow students that want the experience working at a dairy farm to have that experience. Some semesters he's supervising over 20 students that are working at least one shift at the dairy. We milk twice a day, so we have shifts at 3.30 in the morning uh, when students will come down and milk before they go to class, and then also shifts in the afternoon when we milk in the afternoon milking. Uh, and so it's not just dairy students that are working here at the dairy. We have students in small animal majors. We have students really from across campus that, that just want the opportunity to experience what it's like to milk cows, and they come down and, like I say, do at least one shift uh, during the week and uh, we, we give the students the opportunity to learn whatever they want. Uh, Mr. Mayer is really good at working with students if they want to experience giving injections they get to give injections. If they want to experience mixing the ration for the cows they get experience doing that and get whatever experience they want here uh, at the dairy uh, to prepare them for, for their future careers. As we walk down the manger the heifers get younger get closer to the age of the calves that we showed you uh, to start with. Uh, this is where we mix the feed. Uh, the mixer wagon here uh, is a stationary mixer wagon. Usually at a dairy they'll be uh, pulled behind a tractor, but ours, uh, we load it with uh, conveyor belts that bring it, bring the feed to the mixer wagon, and we mix up the ration. And the idea is that every bite that the cows take is a diet that's balanced to meet all of their nutrient requirements and to support uh, high levels of milk production. So that's, that's kind of my exciting thing because I teach animal nutrition. I enjoy teaching students about mixing the ration together and why we provide each feed that we do. We of course have forages such as grass hay and alfalfa hay that we feed, corn, uh, and then a soybean and mineral mix that, that we provide that, to meet their energy and mineral and vitamin requirements. And show you the cows where the cows are laying down. They're actually laying down on water beds. If you kind of push down on it, you can see uh, it kind of gels a little bit. As they're water beds, we do that to make sure the cows are comfortable. Uh, we try and emphasize cow comfort here, uh, making sure that they're happy cows uh, and, and that we show the, the, the best uh, management standards for our students uh, when they're here at Del Val. Again, you can see multiple breeds represented in our milking herd. The smaller brown ones are the jerseys that I mentioned earlier. This is called a freestyle barn where the cows can move about lay down or go out and eat as they desire. Uh, one of the things that's kind of unique about our herd at Del Val is that we have the annual fair A Day where any student on campus that wants to can uh, lead a cow, prepare the cow, uh, prepare, get her all looking nice for the A Day show, and then lead her around and be judged for fitting and showing. Because of that, all of our cows are used to being handled, they've been handled by humans, they've been handled by students, and so they have a very false small flight zone. So it's nice that we can go out and catch them when we want to, but when we're trying to bring them in to be milked, they don't herd very well. So they, they like individual attention, they don't, uh, and, and, and trying to teach about flight zone is a little bit of a challenge because they don't have hardly any flight zone uh, in our cows. Uh, down here you can see the brush uh, that we use. Uh, the cows will go up and it'll scratch their neck, scratch their back. It's not just for cow comfort, it also helps with cleanliness as it knocks some of the dirt off of them uh, that accumulates and helps keep them clean. And today's a hot day so you can see the misters are turning on at the manger to try and cool the, well you probably can't see it on the camera, but anyway there's a mist of water that's helping the cows uh, cool off and stay cool on, on hot days like today especially when it's hot and humid. This larger pen here is uh, just uh, kind of our special needs pen for any cows that need extra attention, uh, whether 
uh, they're sick or uh, have other needs. And then back here is the individual box stalls. And you see we have a couple of cows in there that are approaching their calving date right now. And so in there we can monitor their individual feed intake and just keep a closer eye on them. The final place I'll show you briefly is our milking parlor. We have a uh, parallel parlor uh, where the cows come in and stand parallel to each other. Uh, we do have uh, monitors that monitor the individual uh, milk weights of each cow and that helps us keep track of their health status. If a cow isn't producing as much milk as we would expect, that's an indication she might be sick or it could also be an indication that she's in heat and needs to be bred uh, as well. Uh, of course, we pr practice good sanitation here. Uh, we uh, sanitize the cow's teats before uh, they're wiped off and then the milkers put on. And then we also put a sanitizer on after they're milked. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, we milk twice a day. I'm Dr. Pam Reed at Delaware Valley University's Livestock Facilities. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about what we do down here and the role that the students play at our livestock facilities. So we have beef cattle, sheep, and swine. So to my left here is part of our beef cattle facility. We have polled Hereford cattle and Black Angus. And we have about 20 head of each and raise calves from them each year. And students in our beef science class help take care of those calves. To my right is the sheep facility. And we have uh, Hampshire's as well as uh, Dorset's and a few crossbred. And we have about 60 ewes that we lamb out each spring. And we also have a small ruminant class where the uh, students work with the sheep. And um, we have student farm workers that do a lot of the work down here and work um, the shifts to feed and clean up after the animals and learn more about their husbandry, as well as having classes on the specific species. We have an animal husbandry techniques class where they learn about all the species and basically handling and restraint and techniques such as um, castration and tail docking and so forth that are necessary for the different species, vaccinating, deworming, all of the necessary health care. At the far end of the barns where the sheep are is also used for beef cattle. We have a chute system down there that's set up, that's state of the art, that allows the cattle to be moved around quickly and safely. We also have kind of a miniature feedlot situation. We do wean our cattle, our calves every year and raise them out to slaughter weight some of the heifers are kept as replacement animals. Most of the lambs are sold commercially for slaughter. Again, we keep uh, ewe lambs as necessary for replacements. We have pastures out behind the barns as well as across from the barns. And we do uh, as much rotational grazing as we can to not overload the pastures and to allow them to stay in good condition and grow up between gr groups of cattle. So um, the older barn over in front of me here is part of the old part of the farm. And so this is often referred to as Farm 3 by the students. Technically, it's all our south campus, but the common parlance is Farm 3. And the student uh, part of this was an original area uh, with an old stone house and stone barn that were part of the original farmlands for the campus. We try to get our students out on the farms from week one of the semester. 
our Intro to Animal Science class. We'll come down and tour the farms so students get an idea of the lay of the land, so to speak. And we come through and they will progress up through having in their sophomore year the animal husbandry techniques and then in their junior and senior years they will go into uh, courses specific to the species in our production courses as well as having animal diseases, animal anatomy and physiology which is one of the areas that I teach and animal reproduction. I also teach a course in alternative agricultural animals um, to talk about some of the unusual species and different types of animals that are raised such as llamas and alpacas, uh, deer farming, ratites such as ostriches and so forth. We don't have any of those animals on campus so that one is a lecture only class and doesn't get to use the farms unfortunately. So most of this area through here is just the older part of the farms used um, for some animal housing as needed and for storage and things like that. We have a trailer that serves as our farm office as well as additional small pastures for usually for small groups of sheep around these barns. We'll be coming up by the house that our farm manager lives in and another barn which is used to house sheep but it is mainly, mainly for equipment and hay storage during most of the year. And now we're going to be coming up to our swine facility. We will not go inside the swine facility because it is a biosecure area. We do handle it the way that most modern swine facilities are handled in that we require students to change their clothes when they go inside the facility into coveralls and boots that are used only within this facility. So everything is kept pretty well contained throughout the entire pig's lifetime. Inside the facility, we keep um, some crossbred pigs as well as some various different breeds. We've experimented with a few different breeds from time to time. We farrow out roughly um, 20 sows per year, I would say, and the number kind of fluctuates. Usually we do about six sows at a time. The facility has a laboratory meeting area for students inside as well as staff to use. It has changing rooms for both the male and females so that um, we can go into the facility in the approved coveralls and so forth. And within the facility, there's a gestation room, a couple of farrowing rooms, a nursery, and then a finishing room. So it's basically farrow to finish through the entire pig's lifespan. We usually keep a couple of boars for breeding, but we also use some artificial insemination. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Ricotta, and I'm a professor of horticulture and the chair of plant sciences and landscape architecture here at Del Vale. So before we get going into the greenhouses, I just wanted to point out one of the things that you'll often see going on here on the Delvale campus, and that's hands-on learning. So the students you see behind me are in Dr. Chris Tipping's entomology class, and one of the things that they do is put together a large insect collection. Those are actually figs that you see behind me, and there are lots of insects in the figs, eating the sweet, juicy figs. And so the students are there with their collection nets and their collection jars, trying to get different species for their insect collection. So it's really interesting. And I was in there picking figs the other day, and there's really a lot there for them to, to capture. So let's go in the greenhouses. So 
This is our conservatory. It's empty right now because, of course, it's very warm, so the plants are outside. But pretty soon, this will be full of the plants that we just saw outside, and some of the other greenhouses will be full of plants that we're raising for our display at the Philadelphia Flower Show. Del Vale has had an, uh, a display in the educational category of the Flower Show for over 30 years, and we've won numerous prizes. It's part of the Landscape Design Build and Landscape Architecture Program to take a class in the fall to design the display, and then in the spring, when the Flower Show is happening, they build it and man the display down in Philadelphia. So it's a great hands-on experience for our students. So this may not look like very much if you're not a plant science person, but this is actually brand new state-of-the-art coolers for our greenhouses. Um, these are what is known as swamp coolers. There's actually water running down them and then the breeze goes through the water and keeps the greenhouse a little bit cool. So we're very fortunate that our greenhouses underwent a huge um, renovation last year. They now are state-of-the-art and our students can learn from that in our greenhouse management class. We grow for the town of Doylestown all of their planters and displays. Um, we have a very robust program in hydroponics. We have a class in hydroponics. Um, a lot of our students want to work in this area, many of them in cannabis. Um, but others just in the hydroponics industry growing um, food and other crops. So we have tomatoes right here. They actually look great. These are a couple of the student workers. Um, they have been, I've seen these from the beginning. They were little tiny seedlings. These are actually what are called um, grow bags. They have core in them, C-O-I-R, which is actually a coconut fiber, and all of the nutrients run through the bag, um, and the roots of the plant are anchored in the bag. And then, of course, we trellis them so they grow upwards, which utilizes the space really effectively here in the greenhouse. And although you can't really feel it, where you are, it's definitely much cooler in here. And that's once again because of the new cooling system that was installed. This is what's called an NFT system. So it's different than the Cocoa Core, obviously. NFT stands for Nutrient Film Technique. They almost look like a gutter, but have holes in them. And the seeds are planted in this what material called rock wool. You can begin to see the little white roots of this small seedling. So we put it in here, and then once again, the emitters with all of the nutrients runs down this. This is always kept moist, and that's what gives the plant what it needs to grow. Now this is a really tiny one, but check this out. In case you're wondering, this is arugula. A lot of this goes to our cafeteria. I left a lot of it in there, but this is just a mass of roots in there. And this is, the, this is characteristic of hydroponics. So, I can just... so we have lettuces, bok choy, and then over on the other side, um, we have some basil. So again, used mostly in the cafeteria right now. And this is part of the hydroponics class, so they use this greenhouse and learn how to manage um, the nutrition, the lighting. Um, again, not anything that you may be familiar with, but these are very, very wonderful LED lights that are state of the art. And if you were to see the greenhouse at night, it would actually grow purple because of the LED lighting. The other thing about this whole greenhouse is the nutrient solutions are actually recycled. So there's tanks that were installed underneath the floor of the greenhouse. And then everything with the lights, the uh, fans, the nutrients, it's all computer controlled. So this is a really very high tech system. And again, our students learn how to manage it in their classes. And of course, you just saw some of the student workers as well. 
So this is an, actually an ebb and flow system. You can see the water um, that is collecting here. That's meant to be here. You can actually place plants in it, and then they're going to absorb the water through the, the media that they're growing in. So this is another type of um, almost like a hydroponic system in a way, or just a way of watering plants. Again, so that you don't get the leaves wet, which is really important because oftentimes that can lead to plant diseases. So part of the renovations of the greenhouse were actually these nice new benches. And there are <laughs> huge controllers for the greenhouse. These are locked right now, um, but Suffice it to say that, once again, everything is electronic and it's com controlled through computers. Now, this greenhouse doesn't look like very much at the moment, um, but these raised beds are part of a big project for the commercial vegetable production class so that they can actually get real hands-on experience in raising vegetables. So every student or pair of students gets a raised bed, and if you were to see this in April, it would look like a jungle. The students trellis upwards, their trellis outwards. Um, they grow so much produce, and there's actually a little competition among them to see who can grow the most. So it's a great, fun project. The students get hands-on experience, and truly on a winter day, this warm, sunny greenhouse is a great place to be. In some respects, I misspoke. This is actually aquaponics. And so take a look at what is in this bin. Oh, there they are. They're coming to the surface. These are tilapia. And so the, t the waste of the tilapia goes into the water. And then that, the waste contains nutrients. And then it's pumped into these different beds or or growing containers um, so that it provides the fertility that is needed. And so you can see that this is once again a different style of hydroponics. These are actually clay pellets and there's water with nutrients in it from the fish all through here. Care for a fresh tomato? This is actually what is called our propagation house. And we teach a course in plant propagation in our department. And the students use this material, it's actually called perlite, okay, to um, root all different kinds of plants. Now this particular set right here um, is not actually for plant propagation. It's actually for our happy houseplants class. Everybody knows that because of the pandemic, houseplants are really super popular. So we have a houseplants class that teaches students not only how to identify all the different houseplants, but how to care for them and how to propagate them. And so what makes this um, propagation house a little different is actually, these are what are called misters, and you can see right now that the mist is going over these little growing seedlings. And they would be going over the propagated seedlings, but of course they're all on timers. These are actually really important because you can add fertilizers and change the fertility on any one of these benches. And so it's really terrific to have this on each and every bench. And again, you can see that it's connected to the mister as well, so that students are learning what happens in a real commercial greenhouse situation. All right, so let's take a look at our landscape design studio. We have an accredited landscape architecture program, and what that means is that after students graduate, um, they will take an exam and become a licensed landscape architect. So what you're seeing is a landscape architecture class in session. This is the studio. Uh, it is 
fully equipped with computers and drawing tables. And when the, sen when the students are seniors, they actually get their own spot, their own drawing table, because their projects are so extensive. The students take a total of six um, studio classes, each one progressively getting more and more complicated with the design and the needs of the client. Um, students also have classes in landscape building, landscape materials, contracting and bidding. So they're doing a lot of different things that m typically culminate in many cases with the students having their own businesses or working for um, environmental engineering firms, for landscape architecture firms. So there's a lot of drawing in this major as well as a lot of um, computer aided design or CAD. So these are models that the students make quite often when they're making a design. They're uh, required to make a small scale model. And a big part of this major and what our professors do is use their experience and their expertise in critiquing these models so that when the student actually gets to the final design, which in many cases they're actually presenting to real clients um, that like they've worked on, say, a park or a, um, an area, a business, um, but they've already been through this modeling process, and so they really know um, what works and what doesn't work based on their professor's feedback. So many of the gardens that you see here on campus are actually here because our students planted them. So we have lots of wonderful places on campus for students to study plant material. In fact, our entire campus is considered an arboretum. And that would be something that I think is really important for anyone coming to Del Vale to really take ownership of. This is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for our students. The community members use this. Um, and so we have a lot of beautiful spots here on campus, um, but it really could use a little bit of TLC. Now this is, we're approaching the gazebo garden, and the gazebo garden is now a community garden spot. So anyone from the Del Vale community can grow uh, flowers and vegetables there. Um, and they welcome people to come in and pick and eat whatever they want. So it's really, although once again, it's late season, so it looks a little messy, which many gardens do at this point. Um, it's really a nice spot and students can come and they can, or faculty or staff, and sit in the gazebo. Um, and we're able to grow things here on campus like cotton. So again, this is a really important crop for the United States. We don't grow a lot of it here in Pennsylvania, but because there's a lot of demonstration going on, we've grown cotton here as well. And then these are demo plots of forages. In our department, we teach a class called Feed Grains and Forages. This is clover. It's adding nitrogen to the soil. We have a vetch crop. We have various grassy cover crops. And so these are here so that students can learn by seeing them, by getting their hands on them, by examining them. So we keep all of these things on campus just for our classes and our students. Now these greenhouses are our research houses. We have an endowed professor in our department, Dr. Carla Garzon. And Dr. Garzon is a plant pathologist by training, and she is beginning to do research on all different types of cannabis. So we're going into the Feldstein Horticulture Center. I don't have keys for Carla's lab right now, but suffice it to say that it is a state-of-the-art facility um, that Carla is using. And then we also have students who work for her, so they're getting experience there as well. Good afternoon, welcome to the Gemmell campus at Delaware Valley University. 
The Gemmel Campus was gifted to Delaware Valley University in late 2010 and dedicated in April of 2011. The campus sits on 386 acres of prime real estate in Jamison Bucks County. Here we have uh, hundreds of acres of wooded lots. We have hundred acres of tillable ground. We have manicured grounds of all sorts and uh, many opportunities for our students to get out and use the Gemmel Campus. Mr. and Mrs. Gemmel purchased this property in the late 1950s. Uh, story has that Mr. Gemmel used to swim in the Neshaminy Creek nearby. This property came for sale and he couldn't help but have it. So he purchased the first 100 acres. Uh, he then purchased five surrounding parcels to make up the 386 acres that are the Gemmel Campus today over the 30 to 35 years uh, that they lived here. Uh, every time something became available, he would buy up the farmland, maybe deed off the house and keep the farmland, or maybe rent out the house. He, you know, he's a businessman all along. So uh, there was many opportunities for them to grow the farm. They love the opportunity to have the open space a big area for them to to live and to keep green in uh, central bucks county the orchard here at Gemmel is based on a uh, pedestrian orchard developed in the late 1970s at Penn State. This orchard was actually planted partly in 1976 and partly in 1977. The original orchard, it's been changed out numerous times over. A pedestrian orchard means that all of the apples can be reached from the ground. They can be harvested, they can be pruned, they can be completely controlled from ground height, no ladders, no extra machinery. Uh, these particular trees are trees that are grafted on a rootstock. The rootstock helps control their overall growth. And then the variety is grafted to that rootstock for the specific variety that we're looking for. Uh, we have the capacity for about 40 rows of apple trees here, about 60 trees per row. Uh, they uh, would manufacture somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1,500 bushels of apples per year if we were full. We're not quite full at this time. We've uh, rotated some rows in and out. These trees are good for about a 20 year life cycle. Uh, so they have to be changed in and out from time to time. As you can see on the apples here, these apples have been trimmed recently to allow sunlight to get in and make it easier to find the apples for picking purposes. These apples are about just a week away from being harvested here in the orchard. Well, welcome to the Roth Farm. Uh, my name is Bryce Cannon, and I'm the manager of uh, Delaware Valley University's Roth Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Uh, the farm was gifted to the university in 1993 and utilized just to some extra, you know, additional farm ground for producing crops that get fed to the animals at the main campus. But what ended up happening was in about 2013, 2014, uh, we got a new undergrad uh, major in sustainable agriculture systems. And then just like we have um, a horticulture farm, uh, you know, where they grow fruits and vegetables for students that want to learn about horticulture. And we have, a, you know, a dairy farm for students who want to learn about dairy science and milking cows. We have uh, the Roth farm for students who want to learn about sustainable agriculture. Um, and and it's, uh, it's DelVal's newest, newest farm. Uh, newest farm department, although it's been here since 93. Again, we didn't really do much of it, anything with it until about starting in 2014. So in a lot of ways, we're still sort of uh, getting through the startup phases of, uh, of, what we're, of what we're kind of realizing the potential for this property to be and um, figuring out how we want to best utilize it as an educational tool. Uh, but very similar to the other um, farms on campus, whereas uh, classes come out um, to, uh, to look at the farm and see what we're doing. Um, uh, and also uh, we have some, some space for student projects, faculty research, uh, and also we uh, offer, you know, through our E360 program, employment opportunities for students that really want to um, dive in a little deeper and, and get hands-on with this, this type of farming. Um, so sustainable agriculture uh, is something that, uh, you know, everybody kind of de defines a little differently, but um, here at DelVal, and, uh, we, we define it as farming practices that meet our three pillars of sustainability. And uh, those are economic sustainability, meaning it has to be a money-making venture, um, e uh, environmental sustainability, uh, meaning that uh, the way in which we're farming and producing things doesn't deplete our natural resources over the long run. And then uh, finally, it uh, has to provide a high quality of life for the farmer and community. And uh, that kind of third pillar, that social aspect, um, is something you don't really find elsewhere in, in agriculture when we talk about what people are doing. It kind of throws people off a little bit, but it, it makes sustainable agriculture a little deeper, I think. We're doing a lot here with uh, what we call multi-species grazing, 
whereas we're seeing uh, multiple different types of species um, grazing on the same piece of pasture and sort of a, a lot of a symbiotic relationships which, which exist when you have this sort of biodiversity on the farm. Um, really, it's uh, an exercise in what we call biomimicry, whereas we're replicating on the farm the production um, patterns of nature, okay? And our sort of one of our main attractions here at the Roth Farm is our multi-species grazing. Uh, what we take a lot of pride in, of course, is that uh, we manage this pasture without the use of any herbicides or synthetic fertilizers. Um, so uh, we're kind of proving that, you know, we can farm uh, without these types of things, uh, which have negative uh, impacts on our environment, uh, which, of course, is our second pillar of uh, sustainability. They have negative impacts on our producer, as they, all, of course, all have a cost associated with them, which we have to pass on uh, to our consumers or, you know, take a loss. And uh, they have a negative impact on the farmer and community because, you know, they can poison the farmer. Uh, and also uh, poison the environment, which you know we share with our neighbors. A lot of the folks uh, who are attracted to this type of agriculture, the sustainable side of it, tend to be new to the farm. Like they didn't grow up on it, um, so this is like their first experience working on a farm. You know, they get interested in this this type of agriculture, this area of agriculture, but uh, they have no experience. So um, we've been kind of building up a nice collection of uh, what I like to call a learning size equipment here, where. Uh, we can put students uh, right to work on a small tractor that's, you know, not really intimidating in size um, and just kind of start teaching them, you know, safely but also effectively uh, the fundamentals of, of tractor operation and field work and um, kind of start them on something small and then work them up to the larger things. And that's uh, kind of a tried and true method of, of teaching people how to run equipment, I think. As, as farming practices sh sh shifted, so did uh, machinery. You know, they stopped manufacturing the stuff that was used before. So as we kind of go back to the smaller farm, the more diverse farm, um, the more chemically, you know, chemical-free farming, uh, we're actually seeing ourselves have to go back to the old, old equipment, uh, back to the last time they made equipment for that type of farming. Uh, but fortunately, that was, you know, back when things were built maybe a little bit better than they are today. And uh, with, it's interesting because with, with 3D printing um, and just, you know, the, the internet and everything, finding parts and people making new parts for old machines, uh, it's easier to get parts now for, for older tractors than it's ever been, and, uh, and economical too. So a lot of the small farms are finding sort of an economical advantage to, uh, to using that equipment, as well as just really not being able to find anything that's manufactured new that, that, that fits their need. Uh, quite a bit of pasture here and uh, one of the interesting ways about we how we manage it is the pasture feeds our animals year-round right so we're looking at a grass-based uh, production and uh, well, how does the pasture feed uh, feed the animals in the winter time if, if the pasture isn't growing well during the summertime the grass grows faster than the cows and goats can eat it down so we, we harvest big sections of our pasture for hay stick it up in the barn uh, put it up for wintertime feeding so it's um, quite a bit of pasture here, but uh, it does all get utilized either during the grazing season or over winter as, as, as feed. And uh, we're particularly proud of how nice it looks, uh, especially given the, the, the fact that we can use, you know, synthetic fertilizer or uh, chemical herbicides to manage it. It's all done through just, um, you know, intensive grazing patterning, uh, haying, and uh, mechanical clipping. Uh, when the property was gifted to Delval, this house on the corner here, uh, and as well as the barn behind us, um, were, were set up as a museum. So the, uh, the Roth family wanted to leave a, a living history farm um, to the school, uh, as well as, as a, an agricultural property for, for educating, um, because they wanted to uh, make sure that people of the future didn't uh, forget about how farming was uh, the, like the way it was when they grew up. And the museum is, um, the time period is 1880s to 1915, so just kind of the end of the, of the horse farming days and uh, animal traction on the farm in America. So uh, <clears throat> we have a barn here full of, of uh, period uh, horse farming uh, implements, uh, and the house is full of household uh, items of that time. Now, uh, the museum kind of got closed uh, many years ago and they uh, sold the farm, or sorry, sold the horses off. But um, since we've kind of reclassified the, 
uh, the farm as the Center for Sustainable Agriculture, um, we're finding that there's, you know, there's two kind of topics mesh well together. Uh, you have, um, well, back then all farming was inherently organic because it was before we developed, you know, uh, chemicals and fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer. And, um, you know, the, the conversation about fossil fuel use on the farm and kind of the, well, we're going to run out of dinosaur bones eventually, right? So how are we going to propel our tractors? Uh, are we going to go back to farming with horses? Oh, well, we'll have electric tractors, but once again, you know, we're relying on fossil fuels to make the, the plastics and components that go into uh, producing batteries and, and solar panels and whatnot. So um, the small-scale farmers uh, with the rising cost of machinery and fuel uh, are finding that there is a trade-off um, and uh, certainly a, a, a lesser uh, environmental impact of using uh, horse, horse tra draft animal traction, horses, donkeys, mules, on the farm. So um, we're kind of bringing that uh, aspect back into the Roth Center and um, our donkey also uh, doubles, double duties guarding our chickens from foxes and then also doing some small um, you know, produce work on our, on our fields here. So we're sort of reintegrating that, that animal traction on the farm and, and letting people kind of um, <clears throat> look, at, look at that and see what all goes into uh, farming with horses. We, you know, we have this, this student farm market here where uh, we call the student run farm market because the students are actually uh, involved in every step of the, the marketing process. They kind of uh, design the market, um, uh, mess around with pricing and, and any of those types of managerial uh, you know, um, decisions as well as just general staffing and, and salesmanship on the floor. So we're able to offer just about everything that the school produces at the ag farms for sale. We have meat from main campus. Uh, you know, beef, pork, and lamb. We have our own grass-fed beef. We have our own pasture-raised chicken eggs, and of course, just uh, all kinds of goodies from the um, the hydroponic uh, greenhouses. And one of the really cool things about uh, the Roth Farm is it's the only department on campus where students get get to see the whole picture. So you know, like we have a dairy farm where they can learn how to milk cows, or a livestock farm where they can learn how about feed animals, or other departments where they learn about growing plants. But here at the Roth Farm. Um, they, they, they use the manure from the animals to grow the crops that then they feed to the animals um, and, and, and grow the animals on that. So it's, um, it's sort of an all-encompassing thing. If you work here a year, you really get to learn, learn a lot and, and, and see the whole system in, in place. Um, it's really an exercise in just sort of general farming, you know, learning all the skills of, of a diversified farmer, which is you know, like the farms that we used to have before you know, things changed.